First of all, uh, I again welcome all of you uh, in the course Introduction to Islamic Sciences. Uh, in our last session, we discussed some important aspects uh, of Islamic theology, and we will also continue today uh, the same subject. But I would like to uh, recap uh, some of what I have already discussed in brief, and then we will inshallah continue our today's lecture. Uh, first of all, uh, in uh, my first session, in the last session, uh, I discussed uh, this issue that we have different Islamic branches. We have uh, different aspects of Islam. When we want to understand Quran, when we want to understand our religion, it is extremely important for us to know that there are different uh, branches, there are different dimensions, there are different aspects of religion. So one uh, aspect is theological aspect, other aspect is jurisprudential aspect, uh, another aspect is ethical aspect, philosophical aspect, and uh, mystic aspect as well. So we started this course, uh, if we are going to complete this course, then we will be able to understand uh, uh, theological aspect, uh, we will be able to distinguish from uh, each other. Uh, different branches are there. Normally when we are listening speeches or lectures uh, on Islam or any religion, it can be on Christianity or Judaism. The problem is that we don't understand that uh, under what subject or branch other person is talking or speaker is talking. For example, if there is a theological issue and we don't understand that this is theological issue, not the jurisprudential issue, not the ethical and moral issue, then we will not be able to understand what the speaker is saying. It will be difficult for us. This is why uh, we are going to have this course um, on theology, on jurisprudential aspect, on ethical and philosophical, so that in the end, we will have this ability to exactly put every aspect on its own place. And then it will be very easy for us to understand Quranic verses and other issues related to religion. Second thing is uh, we started from theology, ilm kalam it is called in Arabic Ilmul Kalam, and this is Islamic theology. So we started from this subject. Islamic theology, as I discussed last time, is related to our aqaid, our belief system. Uh, it is related to our intellectual aspect, our thoughts. So whenever we are uh, speaking logically and rationally, so it is related to our uh, theology, or it is related to our intellectual aspect. So we have set of beliefs, we say it is a kind uh, set of beliefs, for example, we believe in God, we believe in uh, oneness of God, we believe in prophethood, we believe in imamat, we believe in the day of judgment. So we have this uh, usul uh, we have a kind uh, theology is discussing basically our aqaid, our belief system. And belief system is extremely important for us. If we want to be called Muslim, for example, then we need to have this belief system in our life. If, for example, someone is Christian, for Christians, they have their own belief system. So being a theologian, what is my responsibility? So my responsibility is that if, for example, I am a specialist and I am expert in theology, it means that I am uh, working in three different areas. One area is related to shubhad. People are doubting us. 
people are casting doubts or they are criticizing your belief system. So in social media, uh, YouTube, Facebook, you will see a lot of people are there who are questioning your uh, uh, basic belief system. They are denying existence of God. So who should really uh, respond to these people? So theologian is responsible to respond to these people. Even if we are studying theology and we have better understanding, then we can, first of all, we will not be impressed from them. We will not uh, get their idea and we will not adopt without uh, thinking and without pondering over. And second, we will be able to uh, respond to them and we will be able to defend ourselves. So defending ourselves means that being a theologian, it will be our duty to defend our belief system. It will be our duty to give answer to those who are questioning our belief system. If someone is asking me that why we are believing God, when we have faith in God, so we must have uh, logical arguments, we must have philosophical argument, we must have our intellectual approach. So this will be helpful for us. Uh, another thing is that being a theologian, I need to define the boundaries. For example, if I am Shia Muslim, then there are uh, the lines should be drawn. Uh, there are specific limitations and boundaries. So where I can go and uh, if I am exceeding the limits, then it means I am no more Shia. So if I want to be Muslim, so there is a criteria there are limitations. So who is drawing these lines? Who is uh, providing these limits uh, to us? Uh, theologian is a res responsible to do this one for us. The third thing is for every belief system, we have to have our aqaid, we have to have arguments and theology. For example, uh, if I say that I'm expert in theology, then you can ask me, uh, about the logical grounds of any belief system that you have. For example, you may have questioned that why prophets are there, why imams are there, why uh, Allah is not directly guiding us, why we need, why we are in need of prophets, why we are in needs of imams. So this is a question. So who will answer this question? Why day of judgment is required? And then a lot of questions may be there. So being a theologian, I have to respond to these questions. And then I need to teach other people that how you can form your logical arguments on your beliefs, because we are two types of Iman. We have two types of faith. Faith mean, uh, for example, if we say that I am Mu'min, I am faithful person, I am Muslim, then maybe I'm Muslim because my parents were Muslim. My environment was Islamic. This is why I am Muslim. But if I was born in Christian family, so uh, then this will be a question for me, whether I was again Muslim or I was Christian. So real Iman and real faith is related to our own awareness, our marifat. If we have understanding about our belief system, then it will be worthful and valuable in the, uh, in the view of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But if it is just uh, uh, emotional attachment and there is no logical background, then there will be less worth in the view of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is very important. This is why we are studying theology. Uh, another thing we, uh, discussed last time about imitation, taqlid. Taqlid is haram in usul -e din In the principal belief system, we cannot do taqlid. For example, if I say to you, oh, God is existing. So you should not do taqlid to me. You cannot imitate me because you have to have your own uh, system of uh, uh, logical 
principles. You need to have your own awareness. You need, you, you must be able to prove yourself that yes, God is existing. It is not enough that someone is saying to you and you are adopting this one. And this is why it is important. For example, uh, whenever we are listening others on YouTube or any lecture in the social media, so we are not just imitating them. Sometimes uh, other person is good orator and he's speaking in a very beautiful manner. And then it is very impressive for us, but it doesn't mean that we accept it, which we, we cannot accept this as it is because we have to have our mental and theological process for every belief system. If we are pondering over, if we are thinking about that and after thinking and after providing the logical and philosophical arguments, we will be in a position to adopt any idea or any Akida. And then uh, last time we discussed about the different schools of thought uh, we had uh, in the theology. So we are again going to start from here and you will see I'm going to uh, share with you uh, some of the uh, like the book we are already reading and I just want to mention from here uh, we are going to start this heading you can see here, the name Ilme Ilmul Kalam. Now we are going to start from here. I'm reading the text and then uh, this text is very easy. And then uh, text is also self-explanatory. So I, most of the time, I don't need to explain this one, but if you are paying attention to the text and the meanings of the text, then it will be easy for you to understand this one. But again, I will explain some other aspects as well. Maybe there is ambiguity. There is something which is not clear. So I will try to explain, inshallah. So we are going to start today uh, from the name of ilm kalam As I mentioned that in English, this is called theology. So we have Jewish theology. We have Christian theology. We have Islamic theology. So when we, uh, we want to understand the roots of theology in Christian theology or in Jewish theology. So there is a different discussion. So theology is not our word. Our uh, term is ilmul kalam. So it should be important for us that why we say it kalam, why we say it ilmul kalam. So this is why the first thing that we, we can see here and we are going to read this one, it is, uh, so Ayatollah Mutari says, another point is why this discipline has been called ilm kalam And when this name was given to it, uh, some have said that it was called Kalam, uh, literally speech. So Kalam in Arabic, in Persian, and even in Urdu. So Kalam means speech. And when I'm going to speak to you, so it means that this is my Kalam. This is my something I'm saying to you. So this is called literally speech because it gives an added power of speech and arguments to one who is well versed in it. So you see uh, the first reason why we say it ilmul kalam. So this is very interesting. So aspect is interesting aspect is that, for example, if I am theologian or for example, if when you are completing this whole course theology, so you will notice it that you are getting a lot of power, power of speech, and then you will not become speechless in front of others if they are criticizing you. You see, uh, this is why we say it ilmul kalam. The first root of this name is because if I am uh, studying ilm kalam, it gives me a lot of power and because of a lot of power, so this will give me the speed power of speech and arguments. So then I have this ability to argue with others, to give logical arguments and I can have rational approach if I am well versed in it. And then Ayatollah Mutari says, some say that the reason lies in the habit of the experts of the science who begin their own statements in their books with the expression al-kalamu fi kada. So this is a second reason. Sometimes uh, 
so we would see in the past in the history that the scholars they would start their book by saying they are starting their statement with al kalamu fi kaza it means that i am going to speak on this issue i am going to speak al kalamu fi fi tawhid i am going to speak on tawhid i am going to speak on nabuwwat so you are saying uh, you can understand and you can see that books are going to be started and their statements were being started uh, with uh, al kalamu fi kada so this is why we say it ilmul kalam and then uh, others explain that it was called kalam because it discussed issues regarding which the ahle hadith preferred to maintain complete silence now we have uh, another discussion and then we are going to study inshallah today that uh, there are some school of thoughts or some uh, other sects in islam they uh, they normally say that we should not uh, go into the theological and the philosophical and the logical reasons of these things we are not allowed to go into the detail so intellectual exercise uh, about tawhid about nabuwwat about aqaid we are not allowed to do this one and they were keeping themselves silent so this is why in uh, opposite to them so there were theologians who were saying no no we need to discuss all these issues this is why uh, for example if you or even our youth you are asking any question about god about existence of god uh, to these people so they will uh, they will tell you not to ask this question you are not allowed to ask this question because we are not we just we need to we need to follow whatever the quran has already mentioned whatever the hadith or sayings of prophet muhammad is there and then we our duty is to uh, to have iman and faith in it this is not our duty to to understand intellectually so this is very important for us to understand here again we see the quran is created uh, another uh, reason is according to others this name came to be in uh, in the walk when the issue whether the holy quran uh, called kalamullah the divine utterance the holy quran is created or not became a matter of hot debate amongst the muslims a controversy which led uh, to animosity between the two opposite camps and bloodshed of many so this is very important aspect this is another reason that we say it uh, why we are saying it ilmul kalam because in the past in the second half of the first century so there were very hot discussion between uh, muslims and they were between scholars they were fighting each other they were killing each other and there was a blood shed at that time only because of this issue because the issue was about uh, first of all we know that this is kalamullah quran is kalamullah it means kalamullah mean the words of god when it is word of god uh, then the discussion is about the nature and the essence of saying of allah subhanahu wa taala uh, kalamullah that whether it is created or it is eternal so one group was saying that it is it is just created uh, and this is makhluq and other group was saying that quran is not created quran is uh, existing uh, from the beginning and then uh, this quran is not uh created at the certain period of time so this was the hot discussion and inshallah we will uh, we will uh, discuss this issue in later stage because it is extremely important for us to understand the importance of quran because allah subhanahu wa taala also says that ummul kitab the the ummul kitab the mother of this book is before me what does it mean it means the original book or the mother of the book is uh, before allah subhanahu wa taala so this quran is also 
you can say the maybe uh, diluted form of this original book or whatever we will inshallah discuss in detail. So this issue is again uh, important here. So now we are going to uh, discuss about the various schools of Kalam. We see the Muslims differed with one another in matters of the law, fiqh, following different paths and dividing into various sects such as Jafri, Zaidi, Hanafi, Shafi, Maliki, Hanbali. So there are different sects in fiqh, in jurisprudence, and in theology. So we should not mix up these two uh, different uh, uh, sects. Uh, we need to understand that fiqh has different uh, divisions and theology has different divisions. So here, uh, this book is saying the Muslim differed with one another in matters of law, fiqh. So about fiqh, we have, uh, uh, we have Jafri, Shia, we have Zaidi, we have Hanafi, we have Shafi, we have Maliki, and we have Hanbali each of which has a fiqh of its own. So every sect has uh, different uh, principles, different laws, different, uh, uh, this, uh, the fiqh is basically science, jurisprudence. So for example, Sunnis, they have their own jurisprudence, Shia, they have their own jurisprudence, they have their own laws. Our laws are different from them, their laws are different from each other. So this is why, uh, we have uh, these three different uh, uh, schools are there. So similarly, from the viewpoint of the doctrine, they divided into various schools, each with its own set of principles doctrine. So the doctrine is related to theology, related to our belief system. So the most important of these schools are Shia, Motizila, and Ashari and Murji'a. So we, uh, as I discussed last time, uh, we, we should just memorize them. We are inshallah going to study in detail about Motazila, about Ashari, about Murjia, about Shia. And we are going to enter very interesting discussion as well. Uh, so here we need to understand from theological perspective, we have Shia, we have Motazila, we have Ashari, we have Murjia, and we have so many other schools of thought which are theologian, but from fiqh perspective, so we have Jafari from Imam Jafar Sadiq al -Islam. we have Zaidi from Zaid ibn Ali, and then we have Hanafi, Imam, uh, Imam Hanafi, Imam Shafi, Imam Maliki, Imam Hanbali, so we already have this one. And then in the second paragraph, if you see that we are going to just, uh, yeah, read this one, and then here it is possible that the question may arise as to reason behind such regretful division of the Muslims into sects in matters dealing with Kalam and Fiqh. Now, Ayatollah Mutari says that what happened in the history? So why it is regretful division? Why people should be divided from each other? Why I have my own Fiqh, they have their own Fiqh? Why I have my own theology, they have their own theology? Why we don't have uh, unity, why we are not united. Uh, so this is an issue. So he's saying that why they could not maintain their unity in these spheres, the difference in matters of Kalam causes disunity in their Islamic outlook and the disagreement in the matter of fit deprives them of the unity of action. So, you know, uh, what he's saying is when we have different jurisprudence, we have different laws, we have different theology. So we cannot have a unity of action. My action will be different, others action will be different. And this is why we have uh, very dangerous differences between Muslims denominations. And even they are declaring kafir to each other, they are killing each other, they are insulting each other, they are disrespectful to each other. Why they are like this? Because they have their own uh, way of thinking. They have own theology. So Ayatollah Mutari says that this is very regretful situation that there is no unity in our uh, different denominations. And then, and then we see both the question and the regret are justified. 
but it is necessary to pay attention to the two following points. These two points are important. Ayatollah Mutari says that despite the fact that disagreement in issues of faith among the Muslims is not so great as the shatter to uh, the foundations of the unity of doctrine, outlook, and mode of, mode of practice. So he's saying that it's okay that there is a disagreement. They are different from each other. They have their own faith. They have their own theology. But it is not so great as to shatter the foundation of the unity. He is saying still unity is there. Why? How we can say that still unity is there? Because he's saying that mode of practice and the doctrine outlook, there is a unity in this. When we say, uh, when we see between Shias, so for example, we have Ismaili, we have Zaidi, we have uh, 12th Imams. Uh, so in Sunnis, you have seen that they have also different denominations, different sects. But if you go into the deeper level, you will understand that there are so many common principles. There are so many commonalities. So these commonalities, despite the fact that we have different faith and we have different theology, but uh, we also have a lot of commonalities. We have a lot of common grounds. So there is so much common in their doctrinal and practical matters that the points of difference can hardly inflict any serious blow. So there is no serious harm. We cannot say that we are destroying each other. We are not inflicting harm to each other. It is important that despite the fact that we have uh, divided from each other, but again, we have a lot of common values. So message we can get from here is that it is up to us uh, whether we are focusing on differences or we are focusing on commonalities. If I want to fight with others, I will pay attention, I will focus on differences and I will highlight the differences and I will exaggerate these differences on the basis of these differences. So I uh, get the opportunity and I justify myself to be disrespectful to others. So this is why uh, we have problems in uh, between different uh, sects, different schools in Muslim communities because we are focusing on uh, differences. But if, for example, I believe in the unity of Muslim Ummah, then I will focus on the common grounds, commonalities. The same thing is interfaith uh, areas. Uh, whenever I'm going to speak in Christian community, in Jewish community, whenever we have interfaith program. So I focus on the common grounds between Islam and between Christianity. For example, if I'm addressing them, uh, so it is extremely important. And when you uh, look into the common grounds, when you are seeking and you are searching common grounds, believe me, you are, uh, you are understanding it at the very deeper level. And you will see that significant common grounds are there between Islam and other uh, religions and on the basis of these common grounds, we can come close to each other. The second point being mentioned by Ayatollah Mutari is theoretical differences and divergence of views is inevitable in societies in spite of their unity and agreement in principles. Uh, you know what he's saying? He's saying that we need to uh, understand this important aspect as well that in the societies, when we are living together in human society, we cannot get rid of differences. We always have differences. We cannot expect the unity in the human society because for example, uh, my approach is different. My environment is different. My theology is different. My thinking pattern is different. My everything is so every person has different approach, environment, upbringing, so many things are involved. Basically, we should not expect. It's okay to be different from each other. 
And this is why we have beautiful hadith that ikhtilafu ummati rahmatun, that the difference uh, or disagreement of my ummah, my nation, Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him says that it is the mercy of Parvardigar. This is a mercy and this is a very positive thing that if we have difference of opinion and if we have difference of opinion, then we can uh, elevate ourselves. Then we can uh, uh, attain the higher levels academically, spiritually and intellectually. But if all are same, then you will see that there will not be uh, we cannot do anything and then there will not be any advancement, no ag uh, academic uh, higher levels in our life. So Ayatollah Mutari says that as long as the roots of the differences lie in the methods of inference and not in vested interest, they are even beneficial because they cause mobility, dynamism, uh, this, we will become more dynamic and discussion and curiosity and progress. So he's saying the same. So inference uh, mean that you have ishtihad, you have logical conclusion. So if you have, uh, um, for example, the differences, not because I am prejudiced, not because I have my personal interest. If we have disagreement, this agreement is because of my own perception, because of my own logic, because of my own uh, rationality. So this is good. Ayatollah Mutari says that it is causing mobility and discussion and curiosity and progress. Otherwise, there will not be any progress. Only when the differences are accompanied by prejudices and emotional and illogical alignment. You know that even in our uh, different Muslim schools uh, of thought, we see that uh, sometimes we are very emotional. We are not logical. When we are illogical, when we are prejudiced, when we are uh, the, the logical arguments are not supporting my whatever I want to say, then lead individuals to slander, defame, and treat one another with contempt instead of motivating them to endeavor towards uh, reforming themselves that they are a cause of uh, misfortune. So exactly is saying that we are defaming other, we are insulting other, we are letting down others. So uh, this is not right thing. This is what Ayatollah Mutahri is telling us about the philosophy of theology. Now we are discussing not only theological issues, but we need to understand exactly the background of theology, the background of philosophy. The importance of this course is, this is why I'm just uh, mentioning this here, is we are going to uh, understand very deeper aspect of the philosophy of theology, the hikmat behind the theological issues. So these are important for us when we uh, will step into the practical life. We, uh, if we have in our mind about ikhtilaf, about disagreement, about differences, and if we have in our mind that th there are two types of people, those who are prejudiced, those who have their own, uh, their interest, and those who are really sincere, and they think that we have logical arguments. If I have difference of opinion, I have right to have this opinion. If other person have different opinion, then I will be okay with this. Why? Because I, I would say that if I have my right to have my opinion and I have my rationality, so other person also uh, has the same right. So I should not be uh, offended. So I should not be imp imposing my own uh, theology on other person. You know, uh, some of the Islamic extremist groups are doing the same because they want to impose their agenda. They want to impose their aqaid on whole world. They say that whatever we are thinking, the way we are thinking, every person should do the same. So why other people should follow you? If they are not convincing uh, with you, 
if you are not able to convincing them and they have right to have their own opinion so this is why this section we uh, read today is extremely important and this will change our behavior in future and there are two types of uh, scholars or uh, we see in the muslim communities those who don't uh, believe in unity at all they always for example if they are shia they are always highlighted their own values and they are uh, not discussing others they don't like them but those who who believe in unity they are always uh, discussing common grounds common values so this is again uh, the thing which is extremely important for us and then he uh, ayatullah mutahri says that uh, in the shia faith the people are obliged to imitate a living mujtahid and the mujtahidin are obliged to independently ponder the issues and form their independent opinions and not to be content with what has been handed down by the ancestors so now he is saying there is a, a very important difference between shia islamic thought and shia denomination uh, and the sunni denominations or schools of thought first of all in shia faith we believe in uh, ishtihad we have our marja we are doing taqlid to them we are following them and you know that we have less issues because we know where to consult if we have any problem for example now the month of ramadan is coming and then uh, there is a corona virus pandemic and now we have lot of questions about our fasting we are in self isolation we are at home we are uh, having social distancing so maybe i uh, i am afraid of fasting because i may think that if i am not drinking enough water and if i have a lack of water in my body then uh, i may catch corona so if i have this fear so these kind of questions are there so we can easily uh, consult our mujtahidin and today i have a detailed lecture on this one so it is very easy for us to get guidance from them now in pakistan for example i will give give you again another example there is a huge debate now uh, whether uh, mosques should be open or not whether people should go to pray in the mosque or not but we uh, i have experienced with sunni communities because if they have difference of opinion within themselves they don't have one marja they don't have one person to whom they may consult him so this is why uh, at least we have this uh, positive aspect uh, that we have in najaf in iran we have different maraje so this is what uh, ayatullah mutahri is saying and these mujtahidin are uh, independently they are working hard they are pondering over the issues they are independent they are having independent opinions and not to be content with what has been handed down for example my ancestors the hundreds year before our fuqaha our scholars our ulama they have already uh, they had their own opinion now i have in my hand this opinion but why i should follow them this was their own time the time and space is very important at that time they worked hard and they uh, reached to this opinion but why i should follow them i am in this era my time has changed space has changed the human intellectual level has developed our emotional level has developed so it means the door of ishtihad is open for me and it is now very helpful that being a mujtahid it is my duty to uh, to work hard and according to my own circumstances the academic principles i have the environment i have in the light of all these i reach to my own opinion and guide my people 
So this is why we have this very important positive thing, which is ishtihad. So uh, our time is over. Inshallah, we will continue our uh, discussion in next session. So now uh, I can invite you five or 10 minutes if you have any question, if you want to comment something, uh, so you can do this one. Thank you. You can unmute yourself, uh, but only one by one. Okay, so you are saying who is the marja and how do we follow one? Uh, again, this is uh, this is a discussion about uh, today. Yeah, Hina, basically we today just discussed that we have marja and we have someone to consult, maybe in Najaf, maybe in Iran, maybe in another place. So marja means the most knowledgeable person. So at least today I'm just going to discuss about the system we have, about the positive aspects of this system. But again, there are issues, there are questions, and you have right to ask that who is Marja, to whom I need to do Taqlid, and then what is the criteria? Uh, so all these questions are, we will discuss in, when we are discussing another uh, science, which is Fiqh and jurisprudence, or maybe, uh, Separately, we can discuss together. But uh, today, we just wanted to discuss the system we have in Shia Islamic just uh, denomination. Yes, you are right. Uh, so you are saying that who is Marja and how do we follow one? And we must follow a Marja eventually with knowledge. Of course, you need to have uh, deep knowledge about uh, the Marja you want to follow because uh, sometimes, uh, and then there is a criteria that how you are going to get this knowledge. For example, uh, there are two most uh, even uh, knowledgeable people are there and they are, for example, explaining for you, they are telling you that this marja is the most knowledgeable and maybe two other people are coming uh, and they are adil, they are also just and they are capable of uh, understanding who is right and who is wrong, who is most knowledgeable. So there are some ways I, I don't want to go uh, into the detail. I want to keep myself uh, within the uh, subject we are discussing. And then again, this question is again very important that how we can get knowledge. And But knowledge is important. Awareness is important. We must know uh, exactly to whom we want to taklid and then uh, whether my taklid is right or not. This is related to my understanding, my knowledge, whatever I'm getting about the marja. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Topir. Inshallah, we will uh, we will continue our session next week on Friday, uh, maybe five thirty or six o'clock. You will see the invitation. Uh, take care. Allah Hafiz.